Good evening, everyone. My name is Mona Mackey. I'm the director of the Access Community Health and Research Center. And on behalf of our entire organization of more than 500 staff, that provide a million services each year in our four national institutions, we want to welcome you to what we hope will be a very beneficial community conversation. Our series titled Coping in Times of Crisis aims to provide calls to action, fundraising and educational opportunities, healing techniques and coping mechanisms from our leading experts during this most difficult time. We know for many of you and those we serve that our community is struggling to cope with everything that is going on. Our hearts are broken by the painful genocide happening to our brothers and sisters in Palestine. And yet we stand and hope that together we will find ways forward to build a more just, and more equitable tomorrow for all of us. This evening, my wonderful colleagues on stage will focus on our family's behavioral health and will help us understand the most common symptoms and provide information on effective coping mechanisms, helping to guide us as we transverse this most difficult path together. Only together can we commit to fight for something that we all believe in, humanity. I, for individuals who need information about Know Your Rights, um, action uh, advocacy uh, committees, mental health resources, um, and youth activities, we have tables set outside uh, the auditorium. So please, if you need information in those areas, please make sure to stop by. I want to announce that we will also be hosting another training on recognizing signs of secondary trauma focused on self-care, avoid burnout, and survivor's guilt on November 29 from 9 to 11 here at the National Arab American Museum. Before we start today, before I introduce um, my colleagues, uh, if anyone in the audience feels uncomfortable or is finds the topic upsetting, please know that we have a therapist located on the second floor if anyone needs to talk to someone. And now I will start by introducing our panelists, uh, Dr. Murtada Abdul Hussein, who is a dual specialty in adult, adolescent, and child psychiatry. He's an assistant professor from Michigan State University Manson Hospital. He's also a clinical faculty at the Hawthorne Medical Center. Uh, he's been with Access. He's been part of our family for the last two years. We're so honored to have him. And his specialty focuses on treating and managing autism spectrum, ADHD, PTSD, major depression, and anxiety disorders. Also with us, is Naram Dabaja, a Wayne State University graduate with her Master's uh, of Arts specializing in clinical counseling. Uh, she is currently our Survivors of Violence Empowerment Program Supervisor. Uh, she oversees all of the violence uh, programs and she has extensive experience in working with survivors on a case management and therapeutic level. Um, and she's been with us for nine years. Uh, also to my left, we have Cara Torres, who is a long-standing community member and health and wellness professional with many years of experience in health education, nutrition, exercise, diabetes education, public health, and health and wellness co coaching. She's actually nationally certified as a health and well-being coach. Uh, she's also certified as a lifestyle medicine and currently works with at Access with the medical team to manage chronic disease program and education programs. We also have with us here today, Dr. Darren Jones, who serves as our uh, senior community health officer at Access. He's a fully licensed clinical psychologist whose background includes studying post-traumatic growth. Prior to joining Access, he served as both the Chief of Medical Health Services and a Director of Behavioral Medicine Clinical Operations for the Beaumont Health System. He's also 
also provides direction and leadership while he was at Beaumont to the board of directors. His clinical experience includes working with clients who have experienced a wide range of array of trauma life events. Uh, now I'm gonna hand it to Dr. Jones who's gonna moderate the session uh, for this evening. Uh, well, thank you, Mona. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and it's uh, such a privilege to be here with you. And you know, I, as I think about the work that we do every day at Access and I, and I think about uh, what people are going through. Um, and as Mona mentioned, people feeling uh, there's so much hurting going on and people are, uh, they're confused and they're overwhelmed with sadness and grief. Um, and I think what's so wonderful about what I see every day and what I get to be part of at Access is I think when people are going through such uh, a collective trauma, uh, it's easy to, for people to lose hope or to begin to lose hope. And so I'm so pleased to be part of an organization that I like to say um, access is in the hope business. That's what we do. So we deliver that not just at special events like this, but we deliver it, uh, our amazing team delivers it day after day, month after month, all year long. So I think it today is a wonderful opportunity to bring some of what we do uh, to perhaps a wider audience. And so we have this amazing uh, panelist of people I get to work with uh, regularly, and they're going to bring uh, their experience, their training, their background, their expertise to some questions that hopefully are on the minds of people um, viewing this. Carl, we're gonna start with you. Um, what are the key principles of maintaining health and wellness during a crisis? Uh, thank you, Dr. Jones. That's a really good question. So um, maintaining your physical well-being during trying times can be a challenge, right? So we're overwhelmed with maybe supporting our family members and being in the community, and sometimes we neglect our own physical needs. So what are some of the ways that you can support yourself and take care of your own physical needs? I truly believe there's a few pillars of health to really address our, you know, our whole our whole health outlook, um, and so I'm going to talk about those kind of briefly. So the first one that I always like to address is nutrition, right? So how can we affect our mood and how we're feeling and our stress based on what foods we're eating, right? And it can be confusing. So nutrition can be a tricky subject to talk about. So and how does that help? Um, with times of crisis, right? So there's so many experts and you're hearing things from you know, this side of what, what's the proper thing to do? What should I be fueling my body with? So I always like to just start from the beginning, right? So keep it pretty basic. Um, fuel your body with foods that are nutrient dense, whole foods, so eating foods that are you know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins um, are important. I think the other topic on nutrition is that we need to think about is that when we're under stress or in times of crisis, sometimes we are maybe skipping meals or um, overeating or eating foods that are not going to serve us well, right? So um, I think if you can really address daily on getting nutritious foods into your diet, that's going to have a great outcome on your, your physical health and on your mood. Um, the second thing that I always like to address is physical activity, right? So movement, and how does that benefit us? So I, I could talk all day about the benefits of physical activity, and what we know now through research and science is that um, being sedentary and not moving throughout the day has great effects on disease outcome, but it also on, has effects on our stress and how we feel daily. So the recommendation now is that we're moving 150 minutes per week. And sometimes, you know, clients or patients will say to me, gosh, that seems like a lot, right? But again, this is where we can, we can start small. So I would challenge everyone to, you know, maintain their physical health by getting some sort of movement every single day, right? So we know that physical activity, again, boosts your mood. Um, it helps release what we call endorphins, that happy, happy hormone. It makes you feel better. Um, on top of lowering your blood pressure, lowering your blood glucose levels. So there's to so many benefits to it. The other benefit is it helps you sleep better. So how do I start? How do I start moving? 
It doesn't have to be that difficult. We can start by doing simple tasks by taking the stairs, parking your car a little farther, um, stretching you know, between meetings at work, and just trying to incorporate some movement and notice how you feel once you do that. Um, so nutrition, right? So keeping it simple, trying to have nutrient-dense foods, physical activity. The third pillar that I always like to think about and talk about that I always recommend is, is stress management, right? So we're having so many things come at us so much and we're looking on social media and we're seeing people suffer and how do we manage our stress? So there's a lot of techniques with that, which hopefully we can talk about a little bit more in detail, but I just want you to realize is that that does affect your overall physical health. So when we're under stress, you know, some of the things that can happen possibly is we're lacking sleep, right? So we're not sleeping well. Um, we're, we're feeling tense and our muscles are feeling tense. So there's physical attributes to stress. So managing your stress is also a really important aspect of your overall physical health, okay? The fourth one is definitely sleep. So, and that can be a tricky one for people, right? So, but that goes back to our, our addressing our physical health, how important sleep is, right? So the recommendations for sleep is that seven to nine hours. I know, I know. And a lot of people are like, there's no way I can get that. But I just want you to realize that that's something that maybe we can address because when we're, when we're rested and we're sleeping better, we're able to make better decisions, right? We're, we're clear-minded, um, we're able to better serve our community, serve our families, make better decisions about maybe even the foods we're eating. Um, and then you have the energy to be physically active. So it's kind of all intertwined, right? So I'm sleeping better, I'm able to be physically active, and those are really benefits that will overall affect your health. Another key aspect about our physical health and maintaining it is what I believe to be social connections, right? So connecting with people in our community, reaching out for support when you need it. So knowing that here at Access, we're able to support you in those things. So if you need guidance with you know, nutrition, with physical activity, with managing stress, that there's resources for you that you're able to reach out and make those connections, right? Um, and then the last one is that, you know, sometimes when we're trying to help others in our community, we really get overwhelmed and we, we lack taking care of our own physical needs by, you know, taking our daily medications or following up with your provider and doing, you know, just your medical exams. So that also needs to be a priority as far as contributing to your overall physical health. So those are what I, I really consider to be the, the pillars, right? The pillars of overall just taking care of yourself. And, and it can seem overwhelming, right? There's so many things that you need to do. So I need to focus on my nutrition and work out. But what I always like to encourage everyone is that small changes can lead to really big results. So just by making one small daily change, so maybe it's incorporating more vegetables in your diet, or it's taking a five minute stretch break, or it's finding techniques to manage your stress, that can have a huge effect on your health and that can have a huge effect on how you're dealing with stress in times of crisis, as well as how we support each other in our community and our families. I hope that helps. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you very much. And we'll uh, be touching on some of these pillars in more detail as we go along. It's great. Uh, Dr. Mertida, uh, as we're talking about stress, people in our community are reporting very high levels of stress, anxiety, fear in relation to current events. Uh, what can you tell us about what is a normal reaction to that type of severe stress? Well, thank you, Dr. Jones. I think, especially for our community, I think most of us, we, are, we face a lot of trauma. If we name many countries, they went through different traumas. So I can tell we build good resilience to level of a trauma. If you are asking me for people, they did not been in a war zone or did not have any trauma during their life, their response is completely different from our response. The problem with our community, as I said, because we are dealt with many trauma before, that's a good trigger for us to have severe refacing the trauma. That's what we call them flashback nightmares about our personal traumas, which I believe 90% of people, even they lived in it, healed about, told by their families member they lived in that. But in general, I think the most, I will, if we can divide them according to 
different categories about how people show their response. So we, I here for me, I make them like in three, four different criteria: behavioral, emotional, physical, and cognition, and sometimes some social also. So for behavioral problems or behavioral reactions to the trauma, you can see the best thing or the, the most obvious things. Person's gonna be start changing, showing something they they use they don't use to be in this way. Change starting with their activity levels. For you guys, let's say you are friends of you going outside every day and they start kind of withdrawing from you. They don't enjoy going out outside. They they don't have any passion to do what they used to do. This is what we call them changes in the activity levels. Beside activities, changing in the eating, changing in the sleep, changing in the job performance, especially when you are working with people that are facing these things, could be they have their own time of crying. That's how they cope with that trauma, what they are seeing. Could be get stands to the start abusing something they don't use to, like smoking, start from smoking tobacco up to selling it into the drugs, because this is part of unhealthy coping skills. Especially they don't, nobody told them what they have to do, especially if their family underestimates what their trauma they went through. Um, this is part, just example of behavioral. For emotional, again, the most important part is what we call them survivor guilt. They see their people, extended people in that part of the world. They have been living in very stressful environments, being killed on daily basis. Uh, they will have this guilty feelings of they saying, I should be there. I should be part of them. I should feel and hear how they are doing. And of course, you want to tell your people that I was there. Um, uh, this also could be like having a lot of vivid dreams, which is what we call them nightmares. It's more a recurrence of the trauma they went through, which that triggers so easily by the current trauma they are going through. Uh, for physical parts, they will go more about what we call them, not typical panic attacks, but look like panic attacks. Panic attack by itself, it's showing a lot of physical part because an anxiety usually has two parts of an anxiety. There's mental part, how we feel, and there's physical part, how it's showing. That's what we call them signs. So people get very confused about that and so easily run out to the emergency room because they have severe tachycardia, shortness of breath, sweating, tremor feeling they are unable to swallow, dysphagia, that's what we call them, cannot swallow. And even they cannot even hear them. trauma, sometimes go to extend that they can have what we call them uh, conventional, which is like having epilepsy or seizure, but it's not clear epilepsy, not clear seizure. So this is part of their physical also response. Cognition, this is very important because people in cognition, they are in, I'm, I'm seeing that on daily basis now, I have people there in their 50s, in their even 40s, they come to me, they say, I think, I think I have Alzheimer's because I start forgetting. And that's very normal. Lack of concentration, this is the main uh, symptoms or the main symptoms during for anxiety and depression. So they start saying, I cannot remember anything. Students, they start have declining in their school performance because they are going through, unable to focus. They have very short attention span. So, and of course, they cannot uh, remember anything. And finally, I think the, the social, uh, according to level of your resilience, according to level of how much you are able to cope, people with very low resilience, very primitive coping skills, what they're gonna start? They're gonna start showing aggression, aggressive behavior. That's what they're gonna start. You would see them very easily irritated, easily agitated, especially teenagers, people in around 90s, especially male. Female, they are gonna show more social verbal aggression. Male, they're gonna show more, uh, more uh, physical aggression. You can tell them you are not the normal person. You used to talk about this. 
people that cannot handle any criticism. And that's what we are seeing now. When people go out for any rallies or something, it's so easy to start fighting because they lack of this resilience. So this is the most obvious normal trauma response to trauma. We can say normal trauma. Very good, thank you. And then so connected to that, and I'd like to open this up to uh, everyone on our panel, what are some ways that people can cope with uh, their mental health stress during these times? I think, thank you, Dr. Murtada and, and Kara. And I think, you know, today's conversation is so important because what we are seeing and hearing a lot from community is, you know, the things that a lot that Dr. Murtada touched on, I, you know, can't focus, I, you know, can't concentrate, um, the guilt, I hear that a lot from mothers with young children. And that's why it's so important, the community piece and coming together and creating uh, opportunities like this, a safe place for, for having conversations like this, I think that's a start for us as a community to build and to, to be there for each other. Because the reactions and the things that we are seeing, these are real. And here at Access, our community's health and well-being is the utmost priority for us. And so the things that we're talking about today and your presence here today and the fact that you are here today and the fact that we are having this conversation and becoming more aware of the resources and, and coping mechanisms and techniques that you can use is a start to, to be able to cope as a community, as individuals, families, and community. Absolutely, thank you. Other thoughts about coping? I'd like to add something. Um, in terms of coping with mental health stress, I think it's really important that your social groups, the people that are around you, are very positive influences. I feel like those that are in your everyday life should be people that are contributing to your positive outcome in life. And um, I think it's very important to set boundaries with those that are providing negative impacts in your lives. Um, those that are not feeding your growth shouldn't be involved in your everyday living. Um, being able to openly communicate with those around you is really important. It's vital to be able to express yourself, share how you're feeling, have that reciprocated back because others might be feeling very similar to what you're feeling. And, um, you know, just finding something that you're really passionate about too and making that time to focus on that passion of yours if it's not daily, at least three times a week. Um, you know, it could be exercise, it could be meditation, it could be prayer for those that are, you know, uh, that turn to their faith. It could be drawing, painting, reading, uh, whatever it is. I mean, just find that passion of yours. I know, like, a lot of people during this time lost their sense of passion, but, you know, if you just retract to a time that was good in your life just to focus on what it was that you used to love doing every single day, you could bring that back to life and, and just start slowly, as Kara said, a little goes a long way. Uh, so I just want to add for the cobbings, I think because we are saying cobbing skills, we should also differentiate between teenager, preschool, school age, and adults. But there's a very important part. For the teenager, they don't have a good maturity to adapt healthy coping skills. And in our community, in many communities also, they share with what we call them substance abuse. So as you get access to that, and this is the simplest things, and easiest way to cope with your stress. And start with one cigar, with one drink, with one shot, and get on and on and on. And why? Because this is the easiest and the fastest way to cope with your anxiety, to cope with your guilt. So I believe for teenager and uh, younger kids, I think the best way to help them with the coping skills is to reach out to any mental health facilities. Because there they're gonna teach them how they cope with that. Because again, it's very hard to sit with your kids and tell them what their kind of coping skills. Because I'm sure most of us, we don't know what's the healthy coping skills. And also all these coping skills adaptations, we talk about different kind of uh, psychotherapy, 
there's different version for a teenager and kids. We have them very normal for all adults. We do that always, it's very easy. But for teenagers, we have to go to their level to teach them what they have to do. Well, thank you. And, and along those lines, I think it's a good time for us to talk about what I think is one of the most uh, pressing topics uh, that people are asking about is how do we talk to our kids about what is going on? Uh, how, what's the best way to approach it? And some parents are really not sure about that. So can you offer some ideas about yeah. how to do that? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jim. So I think, first of all, as I mentioned actually earlier, you should focus on yourself as a parent, as a guardian, as an uncle, as a dad, auntie. You should focus on yourself first. See, are you able to cope with that? What you have to do? And then you reach up to the kids and answering them. So for kids, usually if we have school age and adult adolescents, usually adolescent or teenager, they barely asking you these questions, but mostly from the school age. And that's what I hear always when I get in, in our practice, what should I tell them? But if you look at the parents by themselves, they lack the coping skills for themselves. They are, they are more anxious than their kids. Sometimes their kids try to help them to adapt or cope with that. So for the level of the, first of all, you have to be very honest with your kids. When they ask you, you should be very honest. Tell them, don't try to underestimate what they, how they think. Don't underestimate how smart they are. Uh, tell them exactly what's going on, but in a simple language, according to them. And also listen to them, ask them, what do you think? Or what do you think about what's going on? Uh, what's your idea, what we have to do? What are you gonna do if you are there? And listen from them, and you'll be surprised. They will have a lot of ideas from school, from social media, from anywhere. They're gonna open up more ideas to how to teach, to teach them or how to talk to them. So again, simple questions, simple uh, answer, and let them share what they think about that. And of course, when you talk to them, uh, also try to avoid exposure to social media as much as possible. Tell them maybe we have one hour to see the social media and try to monitor more what they are doing there in social media. Because again, even it's a war, even we know this is like a genocide there. I know there's a lot of murder there, a lot of kids that have been killed. So far, not more than 4,500 kids, which is brutal, but there's still a lot of manipulating there in the social media. They post many things, it's unreal. So you should talk to, talk to them. At the same time, when you hear from them all these bad things, remember them always. There's always good things after, after, after that bad time. And remind them about when they were sick, for example. Remember when you were sick? How bad it was? It takes you a couple of days. And remember what happened after that. How was that? What kind of reward we gave you? What kind of retreat we gave you when you get better? Remember when your dad had an accident? Remember these days? And remember what happened after that. So this kind of uh, explanations would be easier for them. And again, they should focus on themselves first before they talk to the kids. I agree, Dr. Murtad. I want to touch on that because I think it's so incredibly important. We have a long road ahead of us. And in order to help our children and to help our community, we have to start with ourselves. Some of the things that Cara was talking about are so incredibly important. Focusing on self-care. And one of the things that I hear often over and over again is I can't stop watching social media. I can't, I don't know what to do. I, I can't separate myself. I, this, and you know, the recommendation is, so right when we, we talk about mental well-being, and so mental well-being has the emotional, psychological, and the social factor of it. And so part, taking care of ourselves, and in order to do that, we have to follow some of the recommendations, baby steps, however it is that you can to help yourself 
in order to help others, or we won't be able to take care of our families. We won't be able to take care of our neighbors and our community. So we must start with ourselves. I think it's so incredibly important, especially at a time like this. And as far as social media, when we think about mental well-being, it is extremely important that we limit the social media as hard as it is for so many of us. We have to in order to take care of ourselves because of the images, they're horrific. They're, they're just too much for anybody to handle. And I know staying connected is important, but at the same time, we have a, we have, we have a lot on our plate right now and our community and our families rely on us and it has to start with us. Yeah, thank you, Mona. And I know I've, I've heard talk of uh, putting your family on a social media diet, really laying out for everybody that's part of the family, um, laying out what the guidelines are, even if it's just for a limited period of time. But to have those conversations um, and to be able to make sure that they are age appropriate conversations, depending on the ages of your children and so forth. So we talked, um, we mentioned feelings of guilt earlier. And I, I was hoping that we could take a look at how, what are some ways that people can deal with these feelings of guilt as they continue to live their lives normally or semi-normally, even though there's all this, uh, all these atrocities going on. I'm wondering if you could address that. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, I think the first most important thing in uh, feeling survivor's guilt, as Dr. Murtada touched base on, is um, allowing yourself to know what it is that you can and cannot control. Um, during these times, there's a lot that we cannot control. Obviously, we cannot control what's going on overseas. However, we can control what's going on in our everyday life. I think contributing back to the community, contributing in any way positive, is also a good way to cope with that guilt. Um, I think setting boundaries for yourself that are healthy is also really important. Limiting that social media if you feel that it's overwhelming, um, you, if you find yourself constantly looking at posts, if you feel like you're constantly seeing negative posts, um, in your own way, you would know that sharing something that would maybe teach individuals, maybe show individuals that are unaware of what's going on, to provide that positive feedback. And as Dr. Murtada was saying, at the end of every tragedy, at the end of every traumatic event, there is positive outcomes and you need to remind yourself what it is in your current everyday life is positive, what it is that is negative, and just remind yourself of all the good things that you have every day. Thank you, Nam. Uh, Dr. Mertida, could you talk a little bit about, um, I think one of the things that people often ask is, um, you know, they may say, I'm really concerned about a, a friend or a family member, uh, about their, how they're doing, uh, especially their behavioral health, but I'm not sure how to approach them. Do you have any advice for them? Uh, well, again, I mean, if you talk about people, they share the same background, uh, they were in the same kind of trauma sense before. Um, I think the best way you can reach out for them, just stick to the routine. That's very important. Don't change anything from routine. For example, if I help my neighbor, I see him always every day, good morning, good morning, something like this, or invite them over. I have to stick with that routine. And then when I get them there, we start gradually touch base on them. Because we never know that's friend, what they are dealing with. Maybe they have severe PTSD, underestimated, never been treated. When you trigger them with many questions, especially in the beginning, you don't expect what their reaction, although they are their friend. But believe it or not, you don't know them. So I will start with the start just general. How is the news? Do you see the news? Do you watch the news? What's going on there? Um, do you know Mr. X? He's there. What do you think about him? How he's doing? And by the way, do you have a family member there? Well, they tell you there. So this is the way of approach because you don't know, again, special people with different backgrounds, with different experience with the trauma. We don't know how to, what we have to touch base with them. So again, I think stick, stick, uh, stick with the routine that you have been doing with them always and ask them gradually about their life. Then if they know someone that they have seen things. 
So I think that's the, the most important way to approach people that you don't know exactly. Okay, very good, thank you. And, and Naham, could you talk a little bit about what are some of the uh, signs um, that people might look for in a person they know uh, that might make them, let them know that they might need some behavioral health support? Um, I think there are several factors that could show that someone would need help. Um, you know, signs of isolation, signs of a change in their affect and their mood, uh, aggression, frustration, very low patience in certain circumstances, uh, low appetite, sleep disturbances. Um, I think if you truly know somebody, you can tell whether or not they are having some trouble mentally. And I think um, being that anchor for them and just letting that person know that you are there for them would benefit them greatly, whether they're ready or not. When they will be ready, they will reach out to you when you do um, recognize these signs and, and let them know that I do see a change there, what's going on, be that lending ear. You're good. And, and along those lines, um, we know that one of the most challenging things for people throughout our society is when they do need behavioral health services, often people are completely bewildered about how to do that. Uh, and there's a lot of bewildering aspects to it. Uh, even those of us in healthcare, I think, will agree. So uh, do you have any advice for people about some first steps when they do want to seek behavioral health services, how they can access those? Right. So for individuals that do have health insurance, they could just call their health, health insurance directly, um, and they would be given a directory of providers that do accept their insurance. Um, on the other hand, our organization does provide services for those that are insured and uninsured. So that's a great benefit. Um, I think that reaching out to, you know, nonprofit organizations in your communities just to see, you know, how they can direct you to uh, mental health services is also beneficial. Reaching out to faith-based organizations as they could be community partners to these organizations is also beneficial. I would like yep. to add mm -hmm. that it's very important for us to know that what we're feeling right now for a lot of us is normal. This sense of, of feeling you know, like we're losing our minds, not sleeping, not eating, feeling a, a bit disconnected, guilty. I want us to all understand that given what we are dealing with, that is pretty normal. The stuff that Naham is, is alluding to is we have to pay attention to each other, right? So we understand that given what's going on, that to an extent, a lot of those you know, symptoms are, are normal. That's, that's how most of us are feeling or, or will feel that way. When does it become concerning? When it affects a person's daily activity, they're totally withdrawn. Um, if they were going to school, they stopped going to school. If they were working, they stopped going to working. If they were going out with friends, they, they're no longer answering the phone. When it becomes more to that level, but I think it's critical, right? Because our community right now needs support. We all need support. We all need to be that understanding, you know, person for people. When people disclose to us how they're feeling, we can't be like, oh my God, there's something wrong with you. Go see a mental health you know, professional. That, that can't be our approach. Our approach is to keep checking in on that person. And if we see that person you know, withdrawing and becoming to a point where it's becoming concerning, then we slowly engage with that person. Because if, if you're in a bad place and someone's coming at you, you need you know, services, you need help, they're gonna get discouraged. We don't want that. We, we have to be understanding to, to the feelings that in, in these symptoms that people are exhibiting and experiencing. And again, we have to do this. That's why that self-care piece is so important because we have to be there for each other. And so if you know somebody, if you or you know somebody who you see going down that path, we have to start by checking in. And then make sure that you're equipped with resources. Sometimes they may not be able to listen or comprehend or accept in that moment, but if you leave them information and you keep checking in on them, the, what we see most of the time is people will be accepting. But I want us to understand 
that this is a very difficult time and people are experiencing all kinds of emotions which are for the most part are normal. Yeah, and sometimes we use the phrase normal reactions to abnormal events. Mm -hmm. So it's our body's way, it's a stress response. It's our body's way of protecting us because it feels like it's under threat, right? So those things are really important. And it leads us to, a, a, I think, a really important question. We all, even when there isn't a crisis, we hear a lot about stress and stress management. We're all, I think most of us, always trying to reduce stress in our lives. So Kara, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, since there's so much, so many stress management techniques that we hear about, what are some evidence-based ways to relieve stress? Sure, and this is gonna be very individual, and I, I encourage everyone to give a few of these techniques a try and see what's gonna work best for you, right? So one of the techniques that I always encourage is um, what we call mindful meditation. Um, and so what does that mean when we talk about mindfulness and meditation? So the technique with the meditation is that you're becoming centered in the present moment. So you're trying to clear your thoughts in a comfortable place, relaxing your heart rate, and just kind of clearing your mind and being centered on the present moment, right? And affecting also your breathing techniques. So what we know is that you know deep breathing techniques also helps reduce stress, um, clear your thoughts, lower blood pressure, um, and it has many physical attributes. So mindful meditation. How do you get started with mindful meditation? Well, you can start by just trying to find a comfortable space in your home, turning off all distractions, taking a few minutes to clear your thoughts, relax your muscles, and try to some of these breathing techniques. There's also many, many resources that you can find online that are free. There's, there's apps. There's YouTube. Um, so I encourage everybody to take some time to practice meditation. There's been so much research out there um, with the benefits of meditation. So um, that's really one good technique that I encourage everyone to try. Um, the next one that I would say would be what we call the breathing techniques, right? So breathing. So even taking just a minute to inhale through the nose. I'm going to show you. And exhale through your nose. Right? So relaxing your muscles and taking time to take in breath, even just doing that for one minute has huge health benefits. So that will relieve your stress, kind of clear your thoughts, and hopefully um, bring your blood pressure down and make you feel a little better. One of the third techniques that I always like to talk about and encourage people to try is, is, uh, is muscle relaxation. So we call that PMR. And maybe you've seen before a stress ball, right? So we've um, had stress balls. And what does that do? So that means that we're, we're taking a muscle group we're tensing it, so we're, we're lifting up our shoulders tight, or you know, if everybody wants to try with me, you're squeezing the balls of your hand, so nice and tight, take a deep breath, and then we release the tension, and our body reacts to that by releasing our, our, our calming our, our nervous system, relaxing our muscles, and alleviating stress. So trying those techniques and starting from head to toe, relaxed, just tensioning the muscles and then relaxing them will help with the physical attributes of stress too. Because we do know stress can cause you know, pains and aches and sometimes we don't realize that could be caused from stress or anxiety. I'll go back to the importance of sleep, right? So why is sleep important? Well, one of the effects of sleep is that it affects our stress and our anxiety levels. So prioritizing your sleep is super important. Um, how do we do that? Well, I always encourage by setting a schedule. Right, so being consistent with the time you try to sleep is important. So, you know, I'm going to try to go to bed every night at 11 p.m. and sleep, you know, till 6 a.m. So, if you're consistent with the schedule, it'll be coming a little bit easier. So, set a schedule for yourself, right? Um, and like, you know, my my colleague said is that sometimes it means turning off those devices, right? So, shutting them down, having you know, quiet calm, dark room um, that you're able to sleep. There's other techniques as well for sleep that um, you know we, I would love to share with you offline, but there's aromatherapy, there's other apps, but really focusing on relaxing and getting that, you know, that sleep is gonna be important for stress management. And then another one is definitely physical activity. So we know the benefits, right? Besides just you know, relieving stress, there's so many other benefits, but we do know that physical activity improves your mood, helps reduce stress, and will in turn help you sleep better. Um, and so those are some of my techniques that I, I really like to share with people. Again, it's very individualized. We're not gonna always be able to 
avoid stressors, right? We're going to always have stress in our lives. Now it's about managing your stress, finding a technique that works for you. And it could be the simplest things, right? It could be focusing more on self-care, finding music that you like, talking to somebody. Um, anything that you can enjoy as far as prioritizing self-care will help as well. Try some of those techniques, put them into play, and hopefully that will help reduce some of your stress. Well, thank you. It's very helpful. And along those lines, you mentioned um, physical activity and, and physical fitness, uh, especially during times like this. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for people who are really struggling to either fit that into their life or, or maybe they, they feel overwhelmed by trying to start exercising? Yeah, and it can feel overwhelming, right? Um, you know, and it, it, it's hard to say to make it a priority, but I, I hope after, you know, hearing us speak tonight that you understand the benefits of it. So there's a couple tips that I like to say is that, you know, again, we schedule it in just like anything else in our life that's a priority to us. So I always think about it this way, you know, you have one body, we're blessed with this body, and it's it's our job to take care of it. And how do we do that? So we prioritize it by taking care of ourselves, working our self-help, um, and, and again, physical activity. So schedule it in just like anything else that is important to your life, right? So hopefully you can set a timer at you know noon, I can get up and move for five minutes. It doesn't have to be long periods of time. Again, little tips like just sneak it in where you can. So take a few extra steps, take the stairs, um, take some extra laps around the grocery store, find someone to support you, maybe somebody that you can hold, can hold you accountable to take walks with you or just check up on you and say, hey, did you get some movement today? Um, you know, take exercise breaks throughout the day when you're working. I even like to sometimes stand and do emails or take phone calls. So it doesn't have to be so structured. It's just more about not being as sedentary and trying to you know, make it a priority, priority in your life and then sneaking in five, 10 minutes where you can. Because it might feel overwhelming to say, I have to do 30 minutes of exercise. There's no way I can do that. But what we can all do is take a two minute stretch break, mm -hmm. do some breathing techniques, park our car a little farther, try to take the stairs, reach out to somebody to support you. And again, I feel like we have so many resources in our community, right? We don't have to have a gym membership to be physically active. We can you know, reach out to local community centers, um, call your insurance, see what kind of programs they offer. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of resources on YouTube and apps. So just trying to find time to schedule it in Make yourself a little reminder and remind yourself is that what the benefits, why? What is your why? Why is this important to me? Well, it's important to us because we want you to have longevity in your life. We want you to be pain-free. We want you to not have chronic disease. We want you to manage your stress and we want you to be able to serve your community and be there for your family. So trying to remember your why and just sneak it in where you can. Thank you, Cara. And also, Cara, research supports that any amount of exercise Correct. and activity is better than, than none. So even taking a walk, you know, a couple minutes, five minutes, whatever it is. And don't get discouraged if you set a schedule for yourself and then you yeah. don't keep that schedule because we see that a lot. Like people have a set schedule and then, you know, they get busy, something comes up. And mm -hmm. so just try to keep pushing yourself to to any minimal exercise is better than, than no yeah. exercise. And you talked about the stress ball. I wanna make sure that everybody here, as they walk out, one of the resource tables has stress balls, so please take one home with you. Yeah, and I, and I think, Mona, you're exactly right. I think is that we have to just stay positive, right? So whatever little bit you can do, and even if you set yourself up for some goals, so you're gonna set yourself up for some goals, and maybe it's around physical activity. You know, if you don't achieve that goal right away, it's okay, right? It just means that now it's time to relook and see what's gonna fit into your lifestyle. And I think that's the most important thing to think about is that, you know, we're not all gonna be capable of going out and running a marathon, but what's gonna be for your lifestyle that you can be consistent with? And I think that's the important thing when you're thinking about setting goals um, and about priorities for your health. Yeah, that's great. And I, I read some research uh, recently, it's really interesting that uh, on running, uh, mm -hmm. that the, the great news is uh, so much of the benefit of running is front loaded you don't have to run marathons to get a lot of benefit from running. You can run relatively short distances and get a lot of the same effects uh, that you would get if you ran a lot longer. And the last comment I'll make on this too is that there's an interesting study as well as that, you know, smoking, right? That we used to know that was, you know, 
our providers, our healthcare providers said, you can't smoke, that's gonna be really detrimental to your health. Now what we're finding is that being sedentary is, is the new smoking. So not moving every day has really a lot of effects on your overall health. So I just wanted to point that out too, is that you know it doesn't have to be full on exercise, but trying not to be sedentary every day is important. So I kind of think as we talk about contributing to community well-being, this is, uh, I think, an area where you check up on your neighbor and you can take a walk with your neighbor, like just the little things that you can do to really help out each other in the community. And I just thought of that. Because yeah, that's a great way to motivate yourself yeah. and to be helpful to, to others and motivate others. And not to mention, let's like being in nature, right? How does that make you feel? How does that improve your mood? So even if the, the weather's changing, you know, bundle up and get outside, get some fresh air. And there's so many benefits of, even though it's cloudy, of absorbing the vitamin D into our body, right? That also helps with our sleep schedule. So being in nature, you know, maybe with a, you know, someone that can support you and getting fresh air, I think is another really important thing to think about. Yeah. And so along those lines, we, we talk a lot about the psychological or mental <laughs> impact of stress. But Dr. Murtida, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how does stress impact our, our bodies and our physical health, including sleep? Yep. So, as I mentioned first in the beginning, all mental illnesses that we are dealing with, all the diagnoses that you hear, we have mental parts, we have physical parts. We cannot tell the person has mentally ill or some illness without physical parts. For example, for anxiety, you cannot tell this person has anxiety if he's not showing there's anxiety on how he does look. For example, people with anxiety are going to show a lot of shaking, a lot of heart rate, heat heart rate, increased heart rate, uh, unable to concentrate, um, easily agitated, depression, same thing. They start having loss of appetite and loss of weight, or could be opposite, more appetite and gaining more weight. People could be having a lot of uh, craving for sweets, for something else, so specific food. But if we don't go with the more physical uh, symptoms or sign, let's say, the most important one is the cardiac part. That's what we see most of people in the ER when we get consulted to the ER to see the patients. Uh, they come up with for cardiac issues. They think they have cardiac arrest or they have angina or something. When you go to see them, they don't have that. They have only panic attacks. So it's hard to tell which one you have to seek the, mm -hmm. the, the advice. But in general, for example, it's normal for female at this kind of stress to have irregular menstrual periods monthly. She can miss many couple months, could be less, could be more. A lot of irregularity. If she has that more than three months, then she has to go to see her doctor, her OBGYN. Same with the male. For this, I mean, I'm not going to say all the male, male and female, same when they have low sexual performance and desire. For one, two months, that's okay within this stressful environment. If I have that more than that, then they have to reach their doctors. For someone who has hypertension, I used to take some medication, always has the hypertension within well, well controlled. But if he see that there's no change in his appetite, no change in his lifestyle, take medication as supposed to, but has, has a blood pressure again up and out, then he has to go to see his doctor. People with palpitation, it's normal to have early blood heartbeat. Like I'm saying, like very high speed like for almost 150 per minute. It's normal to have them from time to time, but if you have them as a regular, every day, every night, then you have to go to see your doctor. If you are having less resistant for flu, you're getting sick, and after a couple, 10 days, you get again sick again. So this is a good sign or a bad sign for low immunity, so you have to go to see your doctors. Um, many of this anxiety could show as a GI symptoms. People getting constipated, getting diarrhea, stomach upset, if you have that on a regular basis for at least a week, then you have to go to see because most of the stress, the first thing it's showing is what we call them stress also. People with this, all the stress, especially for people internalizing, they cannot talk to anybody, they don't find anybody to talk to. 
with this, this internalizing, there's a lot of acidity in the stomach, turn out to one of this either gastritic or even more for ulcer. So if you have that for the whole of a week, keep it throwing up, unable to put anything down, then you have to go to see your doctors. Very good, thank you. Sorry, I think you asked me for the sleep also. Yeah, right? you were talking oh, about yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So for a sleep, let's first give you a simple in, an introduction of the sleep. As a human being, we have, all of us, we are going through four stages of normal sleep. From stage one, two, three, and there's what we call them, REM sleep, or the stage of dreams. The, the mental illness, how they affect the sleep according to what kind of mental illness. If you are dealing with anxiety, that's mostly going to affect on what we call them initial insomnia, which means unable to fall asleep because you keep thinking. Your brain still obsessions a lot of what you hear during the day, what you are thinking, people there. That's mostly going to affect on you with, with the anxiety. If you get going through more depression now, then you're going to have more what we call them late insomnia, which means wake up very early. You cannot fall asleep again. Sleeping by 11 or 10, wake up by three and you cannot sleep back. That's most symptoms of, or maybe that's telling you you are going through kind of depression. If you are going through PTSD or trauma, let's say trauma, you have trauma before, you're gonna start having a lot of this scary vivid dreams. Sometimes not only nightmares, only vivid dreams is kind of scary to you. When you see that dream is very real things. That's of course where you are very scared. And that's what we call the middle insomnia, which means unable to keep sleep, keep waking up and go to sleep, waking up and go to sleep. So according to what kind of mental illness that you are going through, that's going to affect you in the part of the sleep cycles. Would you recommend that uh, people that might have concerns about sleep maybe talk to their primary care physician first? Well, first for the insomnia in general or the sleep, we normal. Every human being here, we have one or two days, not a good sleep per week. That's normal. But if you have them more than three nights per week, then this is a problem. That's what we call them. This is disorder. It's not a normal reaction to that stress. So yeah, I agree if there's more than three nights per week, mm -hmm. you have them for at least two or two, three, two, two, three four uh, weeks. Now you have to go and ask your doctor for that. Very good. Thank and I also yeah. think we need to focus on individuals who are currently in treatment, right? Because a lot of those individuals, um, we're learning that they are, you know, not being compliant with their medication. They're they're not sleeping. So it, when that when it comes to current patients, it's incredibly important for healthcare providers and community members to stay connected with them because they can easily. Um, you know, go back and start having, you know, severe mental health issues. So it's kind of looking at it from, from two cents of the population, one who is just experiencing some anxiety, difficulty sleeping, um, which is concerning, as Dr. Murtada said, if it's like a pattern or, you know, uh, three days or more. But then we have to look at individuals who are currently in treatment and making sure that they're getting the support that they need. That's a great point, Mona. And as, as you, br you bring up uh, community, let's turn our attention to talking about community and the needs of the community and, and this theme that there's been a thread running through a lot of what we've been talking about, this idea of taking care of yourself and taking care of each other. And so we kind of go full circle back to that. So um, one of our biggest concerns for people is social isolation. We touched on it a little bit earlier, but what are some ways that people can uh, make sure that they're not getting socially isolated or maybe reaching out to be able to assure that uh, the people, maybe their friends, their neighbors are not socially isolated as well during these times. I think I touched on it a little bit where, you know, checking in with your neighbor, your friend, your family member, staying connected yourself is so incredibly important. And, you know, I use today as an example I feel better just sharing the space with you and, and, and being in this room with, you know, folks that um, from the community. And I know that we're all, you know, struggling and trying to cope and be there for each other. So 
you know, staying connected, looking at what, you know, is going on in the community. Our, you know, there's a lot of healing sessions that are being offered, um, just other events in the community, mosques, church, wherever a person, you know, feels comfortable. It's very, isolation is, is I kind of look at it, it's a slippery slope. It can be very dangerous. Um, and isolation also is, it can be a symptom of, you know, being anxiety or depression. Um, but we also look at PTSD and that could lead to isolation. So, so it's very important that to avoid being isolated or disconnected, that we stay in touch with each other. Um, I think that that to me is very, very important. But, you know, even talking about community, finding ways to be a part of the community, right? That helps to uh, alleviate some of that feelings of isolation. And I've been seeing actually a lot of folks more, you know, engaging in public advocacy, you know, um, wanting to volunteer, wanting to donate, wanting, you know, those are things that you can keep yourself uh, going. Um, volunteering at your child's school, um, just again, any organization, anything that's going on, just try to be a part of it. And that's what I was saying about, you know, checking on your friend, your neighbor, your family member. Hey, let's take a walk. Hey, there's an event going on. Why don't we go together? It's so nice that some of you probably called each other, just even coming here. And that's what it's about, right? Staying connected to help reduce any um, event of be feeling isolated. Yeah, and along those lines, uh, does the panel have any other advice for people who want to do all those things, but maybe they're not sure how to get that those resources or to connect with some of those opportunities. Any thoughts on that from anyone? Well, I think I would like to share one of the biggest studies that done by National of uh, Mental Health that's many, many years ago. They show that's one of the best way to cope with all the stress is turn into superpower or the religion. Uh, that's the way they found this is a big uh, uh, significant factor to help with any risk for many mental illnesses. For example, here you can't participate in any mosque, you can't go. There's many participation there and events there. And from there, you can also in, uh, join many other groups through that. Because I think going to church or the mosque or anywhere you are going there, it's less shame, less stigma and if you're going to somewhere else. And from there, someone can help hopefully guide you to take you to the people, the professional people. So I just want to share this uh, uh, very nice research about these things. And also yep. people can find um, information and resources on our uh, web page, and we've been posting a lot on social media. So, you know, encourage yourself or, or folks that who are looking for things, even within, I'm very proud to be part of this organization that's really just trying to be at the forefront and be there for the community. So there are a lot of resources, not just that access, but really throughout the community. And, you know, Googling, asking a friend, um, finding out what resources, there's information outside, please take that information with you, make sure you share it uh, with those who are in need. And I think that's like, you know, one of a first step in, in trying to be connected and finding out what's going on in the community and really calling each other and, and picking up each other and, you know, that buddy system kind of thing really helps to just be out there in the community and, and to be engaged and, and, you know, having a safe place to be. And, and I know when we're trying to make, you know, lifestyle modifications or we're trying to um, relieve our stress or work on our mental health, it's important to feel supported, right? So we know people that have support through trying times and while they're trying to make changes in their life, the more that you're supported, the more likely that you are able to take on these new habits, right? So maybe the new habits you're trying to form. Um, so support I think is, is super important and I think we all have to be comfortable with reaching out to professionals or wherever we can in our community to receive support because we know that when you're supported in these changes that you want to make or with other you know people in your family you want to help support is, is important to you know be all supported in those changes yeah. yeah that's a great point and and in the spirit of community we would like to open up the floor to any questions that you might have. I have been given a question already that I'm going to share. 
uh, but we're going to uh, go out in the audience and, and uh, entertain any questions you may have or comments you wish, wish to make. How do you message conversations with youth in the communities where there are more isolated or, or have previous trauma themselves? Thoughts about that? Youth that have, pre, have are either isolated or they have their own previous trauma experiences. How to message conversations with our youth? Um, I think it's really important as uh, adults or parents or guardians or role models, aunts, uncles, to be like an open ear to these children, to let them feel that they are safe, to let them feel that they can trust you. That's the number one most important aspect is that they feel that they can trust you. Once they feel that they can trust you, they could be open about you know, how they're feeling, what they're going through, um, symptoms that they're going through. Um, I think open communication is very important in the household. Not all children have that benefit of having open communication in the household. So knowing that you can be a role model to children that don't have that is really vital. That's a great point. Any, any other thoughts on that from the, from the panel? I, I mean, I agree with um, Naram in, in the sense that we have to be supportive and we have to be available. And I think Dr. Murtada, you know, kind of um, focused on the messaging. Um, a lot, you know, we have to be truthful, right? And we have to be open to hearing what the youth have to say and, but we also, again, I said, equip yourself with resources, right? Because when you're having these conversations or you notice uh, a child or an adult that, that needs help, if you have the information available, at least you can start that process, right? Because we can't, if they're already isolated, and that's what I was touching on, someone who you know may have a previous mental health condition, like these are things we have to be mindful and we have to take serious. And so having information and being able to have those conversations um, is incredibly important. And, and being able to be mentors, you know, if you see a child or you have a child that's that's having a hard time, make sure that you're having a mentor for that child. Because oftentimes, you know, when we start talking about mental illness or therapists, you know, it's a turnoff for many, right? And I talked about, you know, feelings and how people are, um, you know, the feelings that people are experiencing right now and the thoughts and, and everything that they're going through. But with our youth right now, it's, it's very sensitive. And we touched on social media and how that's impacting the kids. And so we just need to be there for our kids. We need to listen to our kids and we need to make ourselves available for our kids and make sure that they have, you know, the, the support that they need, whether that's through family, whether that's through a mentor, whether that's through reaching out for professional help, whatever that may look like. And again, you know, we're talking generally here, but every person is unique. Every child is unique. We're talking about all of these, you know, coping mechanisms or techniques that people use, but everybody is unique in how they handle stuff and where they are at. So at Access, we always like to start with meeting people where they are at. So um, especially with, with the youth, we, we have to you know, keep our eyes on them and we have to be able to have conversations with them and listen to them. And I think you know, being truthful is, is very important and being understanding, but also being able to provide you know, the support and the resources at the same time. I agree. What else is on your mind, ladies and gentlemen? I'm coming out to you. Other questions or comments? I came all the way out here and you guys don't have anything? Okay. I was gonna say, um, what I've seen people around me experiencing and myself, mm -hmm. this isn't your normal, from all perspective, that was said. It's not your normal stress or your normal anxiety or your normal it's way above. I mean, when you lose a parent, you lose a child, 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 but when you see hundreds and thousands and thousands on a daily basis, and you have someone who is won't turn off the TV, and someone who won't turn off social media, and it's going on, and I feel like some of these things are so um, difficult to implement when you have the extreme people. I'm not talking about the extreme. So 
I just feel it's a different type of stress and a different type of uh, anxiety and, and fear. And, and so, you know, I'm going to recommend a lot of things that you said, but I just feel this is over and above a lot of them, what we've seen. And, and it is, um, this is beyond anything, you know, we've ever experienced. You know, we all thought COVID was horrible and, you know, there's other, again, unfortunate um, mm -hmm. conflicts that, that occurred. And, and this is one that I think um, has been very, very difficult for, for so many. And the thing that we're trying to focus on is as difficult as this is, and by no means is this easy. And again, everyone's different in how they, you know, process things. And, and But we also talked about things we can control and things we can't control. And then we, we focus on the self-care aspect and the things that Kara talked about because we, we got to find a way to, to be there for each other. And like I said, I think the road is long ahead. You know, always when there's conflict or trauma, um, as a community, and, and, and Dearborn is known as a strong-knit community, especially in times of crisis, we come together and we're here for each other now, but it's like the aftermath, right? You know, what happens later? And, and we talked about like there's, you know, things that have happened throughout history, but we've been able to overcome those together as a community. And as a community, we will find our way. But we have to start with ourselves as hard as it is. The stuff that Kara talked about, the, that taking a walk, that stress ball, talking to a neighbor, talking to her, whatever it is to help ourselves is going to be so incredibly important for our well-being and to be able to get through this, right? So, so let me say, this is not easy for anybody. And it's, we talked about like feeling guilty, like, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to have dinner and I'm going to go with my friend, you know, and, and people feel guilty about that, but it's almost like I tell them, it's, you know, it's that little distraction that you need to just relieve your mind and your body, you know, to try to kind of um, take away some of that, those feelings of guilt, right? Because it's hard to, to move on and to go on with what we're dealing with and what we're seeing. But at the same time, we've got to take care of ourselves. We have to. So the things we're talking about today are not to minimize um, you know, the, the extreme of, of this, the circumstances, but more as we got to start somewhere and we got to start small and we have to stick together. Also, Ms. Minai, I want to mention, uh, as I mentioned earlier, resilience is, is a journey. All of us here, we talk specifically about our community here. Most of us, I can say 90% of us, we went through many traumas. It's extraordinary. We went through different wars, different victims, different sea that we saw. We were told by our parents. We saw by when reading our history. Uh, if you talk about different community, I say, yeah, this is a huge thing, which is. But for our community, a good thing is, which I don't think this is, there's any good things here. But if we're going to say one good thing is, we have a good resilience for that. And many research in American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry found kids raised in the war conflict zones, they have better resilience in the future when they grow up. And I think I am one of them because I lived most of my life in a war back in Iraq. The way that we get in now here, when I see that, we remember what's happened. We lived through that, we make stronger, and that's what we have to teach our community and remind, remind, reminding them what we have to do and what we did to survive. And along those lines, access is going to continue in the months ahead to be working more and more in addition to all the other things we do, but really working, how do we help the community build that resiliency and how do we move on from that and, and grow? And I think on that note, we will draw this to a close we have some wonderful resources and refreshments. Please uh, avail yourself of those. I want to thank uh, our wonderful panel. Weren't they wonderful? <laughs> and, and most of all, th a very sincere uh, thank you to all of you for being here.
for all that you do. Uh, and we're gonna keep on doing what we do. And as long as you're here and we're here, there's a lot of hope to go around. So thank you again and have a wonderful evening.